welcome to Man Without a Country, illustrated by antique hand-painted glass slides projected on the big screen just as they were a hundred years ago by the Magic Lantern. Well, the story begins way back in 1804. Now, Aaron Burr, you, you probably remember, he'd been vice president under Thomas Jefferson. He challenged Secretary of the Treasury Alexander Hamilton to a duel, and he killed him, too. Burr was disgraced, of course, and, and so he set off for the new Louisiana Territory on some kind of mysterious expedition. Fort Massac. Burr met, as the devil would have it, a flamboyant, impetuous young army officer named Nolan. Burr talked with him, flattered him, took him on a voyage on his flatboat, in short, fascinated him. From that time on, young Nolan was his heart and soul, and Burr led him step by step toward treason. All that winter, Nolan corresponded with Burr, but then Burr's plans, now, now they say it was to establish a whole new separate republic out there in the Louisiana Territory, but at any rate, whatever the exact plan was, some kind of plot was discovered. Jefferson Hall, Burr, and Nolan, and all the others before a great treason trial in Richmond. But Burr and the other big flies were acquitted. Poor Nolan was a brass youth, no slick lawyer like Burr. The president of the court knew he was not a leader in this affair, so he asked him to say something, anything really, to show that he'd always been faithful to the United States. And Nolan, the young fool, jumped up and cried out in a fit of frenzy, Damn the United States! I hope I may never hear of the United States again! sat shocked. And when they recovered, they decided that Nolan should get his wish. The military, in due course, issued orders that Nolan was to be kept aboard ship for the rest of his life. No one was to speak to him of his native land again. And so Nolan began his career as a man without a country. He was stripped of his rank. He lived in a succession of Navy warships. No man even whispered of home in his presence. He was given only foreign papers to read, and even those were reviewed first, and every mention of the United States was cut out of them. Well, for the first several years, Nolan pretended he didn't mind his banishment. He carried on as if nothing had ever happened. But then once, to while away the time, the officers were reading to each other the lay of the last minstrel, and because it was all about Scottish magic and, and chivalry, no one thought he would have anything American in it. So Nolan took his turn at reading and began without a thought for what was coming. Breeze the the man was so, so dead who never to himself has said, this is my own, my native land. Well, Nolan expected to get through, I suppose, for though he turned a little pale, he plunged on. His heart has ne'er within him burned. His home, his footsteps, he has turned from wandering on some foreign strand. This time, the men were all besides themselves. Nolan gagged a little, colored crimson, but he staggered on. Such that a breathe. Go, mark him well. For him no minstrel raptures swell. The wretch shall forfeit fair renown. And doubly dying. He'll go down to the dark dust from which he sprung, unwrapped, unhonored, and unsung, and 
and here poor Nolan choked it and he could not go on. He started up, hurled the book into the sea and vanished into his cabin. And when two months later he emerged from his room, the brash and laughing Nolan was no longer the same man. He never read aloud again. He was always shy and very seldom spoke unless spoken to. Two years later, at the time when I was sailing as a young midshipman with Nolan, we overhauled a Portuguese ship with slaves aboard. Nolan was the only one who spoke the language, so I took him aboard to interpret. When Nolan told the slaves they were free, there was a great yell of delight. But when the captain proposed to take the slaves to Cape Palmas, their leader began shouting excitedly, No Palmas! No Palmas! Nolan calmed him down and began translating. He says, take us home. Take us to our, our own country. Take us to our, our own houses, our own women, our children. Don't let them go. Papa Casa! Papa Casa! For God's sake, sir, you know what they want. Take them home. And the captain finally agreed. They all fell to kissing Nolan's feet. Well, Nolan couldn't stand the emotion and beckoned me down into the boat. As we sat in the stern sheets, he said to me, Oh, youngster, let that show you what it is to be without a family, without a home, without a country. Stick by your family, let it be nearer your thoughts, the further you travel from it, and as for your country, the words rattled in his throat, and, and as for that flag, never dream a dream but of serving her. You belong to her, just as you belong to your family. Stand by her, boy. Stand by her as you would stand by your own mother if those slavers there ever threatened her. Fifty-five years. Nolan spent repenting of his transgression against his country, living on those ships, sometimes joining in their battles, but never, never, ever returning home. After he died, a friend of mine who was with him in his last days wrote to tell me how it ended. Nolan was too sick to leave his bed, so he invited Danforth to visit him in his cabin, a place none of us had ever entered before. And Nolan had made a little shrine of the box he was shut up in. The stars and stripes were triced up above the picture of George Washington, and he had painted a, a majestic eagle standing above the whole globe. The dear old boy saw Danforth glance around the cabin and said, At least here you see, I have my country. And then he pleaded with Danforth, Surely you know there's, there's not a man who loves the old flag as I do. I'm dying now. There's no, no hope I can get home. Tell me, Danforth, tell me, tell me something of my country. Tell me something before I die. So Danforth risked the Navy censure and took down a map no one had drawn that showed the United States as he last knew it way back in 1807. Beginning with the 13 states no one knew, Danforth filled it out to 34, Ohio and Kentucky and, and California. No one was excited about that one and Oregon and on and on. Danforth crammed the half century of American history into a single hour until Nolan was exhausted and could drink in no more. That night, he died. They buried him at sea. And later, they set up a stone in his memory at Fort Adams, engraved as he had asked. Memory of Philip Nolan, 
lieutenant in the Army of the United States. He loved his country as no other man has loved her. But no man deserves less than her hands. A man without a country is a very sad story just shows you you can make a really bad mistake in your life that will last for years and years. Although, Nolan finally won the admiration and the affection of the men that he served with. That story was so real that people who read it thought that it actually happened. And the man who wrote it, Edward Everett Hale, got letters from people saying, well, I'm glad you have told Nolan's story, but you didn't get this detail quite right. I was there, and that isn't quite the way it happened. So that just goes to show you that the story can be a very powerful thing. Now, this is quite a long story, and I didn't have enough slides to uh, make it move quickly. So I added some slides. Here's some examples. These Scottish slides, for instance, were from Joseph Boggs Beale's story of the Lady of the Lake, which we'll make a video of later, uh, but they fit very well here to give a sense of what it would be like to read a, a Scottish story. So, I hope you enjoyed it, and if you enjoy our videos, give us a thumbs up, share with your friends through social media, and press the subscribe button. Ding the little bell, that will let you know when another great video is coming your way. Thank you.